Hi everyone, welcome to this Sauvignon Blanc Technical Week. So my name is Karin Kutsia and I will be presenting to you the 2020 Sauvignon Blanc Top 10 in a nutshell. So for this year's competition, the judges were Dr. Winifred Bowman, Charles Hopkins, Fiona McDonald, and Rutger van Beek. And they had the task of evaluating 149 wines from 96 producers. So if you look at the class breakdown from all the entries um, in the 2020 competition, we had 149 wines entered in total and 25 of which was oaked and 124 were unoaked. The majority of the entries came from the 2020 vintage and then second um, highest entries was from the 2019 vintage. Interesting, we had four wines from the 2017 vintage that performed quite well, even to such an extent that the Highlands Road Sauvignon Blanc White Reserve even made the top 20 list. Now, I didn't get into the top 10, but I still think that's quite an um, exceptional achievement seeing it's a 2017 wine. If we look at the oaked and the unoaked segmentation, we have 15 of the 25 wines that was entered was from the 2019 vintage. So in 2019, we actually started using tablets during the scoring and the profiling of the wines. Um, this was done in collaboration with the University of Stellenbosch and Dr. Jean Brandt. And we asked, uh, well, in 2019, we kind of tested the tablets and the technology to see if it will work for us. And in 2020, we completely brought in the tablets and used it to score, fully score the wines and to profile the wines according to their aromatic composition. So the, uh, what we did was when it came, comes to the scoring and the profiling, Number one, we asked the panelists to score the wines on a scale of zero to 100. But then also we asked him to indicate the style of the wine using different tick boxes, showing us uh, the kind of aromatic contribution uh, or, or composition of the wines. So you'll see here the options that they had. Uh, obviously this is not an ideal situation. This is quite limiting in terms of indicating the style of the wines. It can sometimes make the wine, reduce the wine to, to look quite one dimensional. But as you can imagine, we cannot have an endless list. The judges have a huge task and it's quite time consuming. So we had to reduce the number of attributes in the list to a smallest number that we possibly can to make sure that the work is, is not um, you know, overloaded. So yeah, these were the attributes that we decided on in the end. And the judges was able for each wine to kind of tick the boxes and decide which of these attributes they felt applied to the specific wine. And they can tick as many boxes as they like for a specific wine. So let's just quickly have a, a broad overview of some of the data that we gathered from this profiling. And now this is just a graph showing us from all the entries in the competition, the frequency of the citation of the different attributes. So first of all, you'll see that the three attributes with the most citations was a tropical fruit, citrus and stone fruit attributes, which is not surprising being Sauvignon Blanc. It's very much in, in line with what we would have expected um, to come out from from the wines in terms of aromatic composition. Then the second, uh, well, that was the first class. And then the, the other attributes that really stood out was the herbaceous character, which 25% um, of the wines had a herbaceous, the, the judges ticked the herbaceous box. And then also the other attributes, green, mineral or flinty, and floral was also part of, of many of the wines. And then we had an oak component where they can indicate um, oak, 7% of, of the wines, um, or the, the judges indicated with 7% of the samples which had an oak component. And then also black currant. So we'll now go through the top 10 
winners um, as a group. We'll look at them as a whole and then also look at each of the wines individually in terms of the composition of the wines, as well as some of the viticultural and oenological processes employed during the, the making of the wines. So we asked the producers to give us as much information as possible regarding viticultural details, winemaking details, the chemical analysis, and we also sent samples to different laboratories for some of the aromatic analysis. And then we also uh, looked at the sensory analysis that the judges gave us in terms of for each of these wines. And you can find all of this in the PDF booklet that's available on the Sauvignon Blanc essay website. So uh, yeah, please have a browse through the booklet and, and you'll find a lot of information in there. Let's just first look at the class breakdown of the 2020 winners. Obviously in total, we had 10 winners. Uh, I think what's interesting from this year is that we had six oaked wines. So if I'm not mistaken, I think it's the first time um, in the competition that the majority of the wines actually had some form and percentage of oak contact. So this is quite unique for this year. Then also the breakdown per vintage. Uh, you'll see we the majority of the top 10 wines came from the 2019 vintage, uh, which was six entries or, or six winners. Three of them was from the 2020 and one from the 2018. So just a few production trends. So I showed you earlier that, well, told you earlier we have um, some of the viticultural and logical details all summarized in tables for you so that you can kind of have a look at in the booklet. But I just went through the, that information and tried to kind of filter through it and see if I can observe any specific trends from this year's winners. So I'll just share with you some of, uh, some of the findings. Firstly, if we look at the origin from the wines or the grapes rather, where the grapes can, were grown, uh, Worcester, Stellenbosch, Elgin, Durbanville, Darling, and Elam. Like I said, six out of the 10 wines received some form of oak contact. Three out of the 10 wines were actually partially or fully fermented with a wild or natural yeast. Four out of the 10 wines were partially or fully fermented with VIN 7 yeast. And then lastly, six of the 10 wines were stabilized with CMC. And I decided to just include this in my, in my production trend summary, just because if I um, think of maybe three years ago, I think there was one wine that was stabilized with CMC. And every year we see this increase, um, you know, with the use of new technologies in, um, in comparison to traditional stabilization techniques. So I'm now just gonna run through the top 10 wines and we'll just have a brief overview of some of the uh, winemaking trends. So the first wine is Alfie Strift Sauvignon Blanc Reserve 2020. It trades at 140 Rand a bottle. Uh, the grapes come from Worcester. It had a combination of wild and commercial yeast to perform the fermentation. 10% Semillon grapes and yeah, the, this wine was one of the wines that had some oak contact. Now, you'll see with each of the wines, we have this big aroma wheel um, that the university put together for us. So this wheel is compiled from the information that was provided by the judges when they did that sensory profiling. So the more judges actually ticked a selected attribute box, the larger the wedge will display in this aroma wheel. So for this wine, for instance, um, most of the judges actually ticked on the stone fruit box. So this just gives us an indication that stone fruit was a very prominent attribute in this wine, that most of the judges indicated that they picked up that um, attribute. Anyway, it wasn't only stone fruit. We see a large citrus component, passion fruit, and then also floral, and then a quite large mineral or flinty uh, component to this wine as well. So definitely more fruity, floral, mineral, flinty um, type of attributes. 
The second wine is Sulmore Limited Edition Sauvignon Blanc 2019. It sells for 120 rand a bottle. The grapes also come from Worcester. It also had some oak contact and the wine was fermented using Vin 7. So we look at the aroma wheel here and you see there's a lot of attributes that was ticked for this specific wine. So uh, it was quite diverse in terms of many different types of attributes were ticked. And this is an indication of typically of a wine with a lot of layers and complexity where many of the, the attributes, it wasn't perhaps one specific attribute really standing out to the judges. Rather, there was many, there were many attributes that contributed to the complexity and, and the um, composition of the aroma. The next wine is a Dimastal Winter Ferment Sauvignon Blanc 2020. This wine sells for 145 rand a bottle. The grapes come, come exclusively from Durbanville, fermented with CKS 102. And for those that are not familiar with this wine, it is uh, the, the juice from, from this wine was frozen during harvest and it was only thawed during the winter months after which fermentation took place, therefore the name the winter ferment. So yeah, it's a little bit of a different winemaking technique with a delayed fermentation. And you'll see that for the aromatic contribution for this wine, quite a large green component with a lot of herbaceous and greenish large wedges showing up here. Um, I'll just elaborate on this a bit later, but you'll see also a lot of very, uh, a lot of fruit characters, stone fruit, citrus and tropical fruit also coming through in the aroma wheel. Next up, we have the Ghost Corner Wild Ferment Sauvignon Blanc 2018. So this is our only 2018 um, winner. Sells for 250 rand per bottle. The grapes come from ELM. And yeah, like it says, it's a wild ferment. So it's wild yeast. Also had some oak contact. And we see here quite large wedges and, and, and contribution of that fruity character. Tropical fruit, citrus, stone fruit. A lot of juicy flavors in this wine with quite a large mineral flinty component to it as well. Then we have the Iona Elgin Highlands Wild Ferment Sauvignon Blanc 2019. It sells for 195 Rand per bottle. The grapes come from Elgin, um, also had wild ferment, and it also had some oak contact. So again, for this wine, similar as to previously, we see a lot of attributes being ticked, again, showing us quite a bit of complexity of the wine with, again, I think the tropical fruit, citrus and stone fruit. So very much more a fruit driven wine, but with, with layers of complexity also coming in. The Kleiner Zolze Family Reserve Sauvignon Blanc 2019. Goes for 220 Rand per bottle. Uh, the grapes come from Durbanville and Darling, and it's also fermented with Vin 7. And we see here very large green component. A lot of, uh, most of the judges would have ticked the green attribute or the green box and the herbaceous box. And then also tropical fruit, citrus, and mineral flintiness. So a lot of green um, character with some fruit to support that and some mineral flintiness also to add to that complexity. Then we have Ormon, Chip of the Old Block, Sauvignon Blanc 2019, selling for 115 Rand per bottle. The grapes come from Darling. And yeah, again, a, quite a large green component. Fruit uh, is present, but not, not the prominent factor. There's a floral component to it, and then that mineral flinty. So definitely in terms of the green and mineral flintiness, it's more the type of style driven for this wine. Paul Kluver, Sauvignon Blanc 2019. It sells for 110 Rand per bottle. The grapes come from Elgin. And you'll see quite a few different yeast use for this wine. I presume that they fermented perhaps individually and, and later blended it. Um, but yeah, a good way to play around and see what the different yeast can contribute to the wine. The wine also had some oak contact and a 3% semilon blended in. 
Again, we see a very large green and herbaceous component, mineral flinty, citrus, and tropical fruit aromas. Starkonde, Round Mountain, Sauvignon Blanc 2019. Selling for 195 Rand per bottle. Uh, the grapes come from Stellenbosch and also three different yeast to use for the fermentation and some form of um, percentage of oak contact. And we see here also again that typical that a lot of fruit attributes coming through in this wine, some green attributes, and then also that mineral and flinty aroma. So quite a good balance between the different attributes um, in this wine. The Stellenbosch Vineyard Southern View Sauvignon Blanc 2020. It sells for 90 Rand per bottle, which I think is the best valued wine from, from the 20, top 20 range with the best price. Uh, the grapes come from Stellenbosch, fermented with Vin 7. And we see here again a quite a large green and herbaceous component. But then citrus is also obviously a very prominent aroma in this wine, especially if you consider we're not seeing that accompanied um, tropical fruit and stone fruit characters come in with the citrus. It's only the citrus indicated by the judges. So I think that must be quite prominent. And then also some floral and mineral flinty characters. So that is just the top 10 uh, briefly in terms of some of the production methods used. So we'll now move over to the chemical analysis. And the, this uh, slide is just showing us the routine analysis from the top 10 wines. So you'll see we'll start at the left from alphabetical order. Alfie Strift on the left. We move over to Stellenbosch vineyards on the right. You've got the alcohol, residual sugar, titratable acidity, pH, VA, and the SO2. So I tried to look and dissect this table and kind of investigate and look for specific trends that I could find uh, in terms of where the grapes are grown, how the wines were made, keeping into consideration a few things and try to see if I can find any specific trend with um, the top 10 wines. To be honest, I couldn't really find anything um, that stood out to me. So uh, you are more than welcome to just go and have a look. It's, it's all pretty uh, normal or regular analysis is nothing really out of the ordinary. So what I have done is I've just kind of indicated quickly for you, the green circles would be the, the lowest value from the top 10 range. And the yellow was from the, it's just indicating the highest value from the top 10 winners. So you can pause on the slide and just maybe have a look if you want to. Uh, like I said, there's nothing really out of the ordinary. However, yeah, you, you're more than welcome to, to have a look further. So moving over now to the aromatic analysis, uh, VinLab kindly um, offered to analyze the top 10 wines for the methoxypyrazine content. And I think what was, too, what was interesting here was two of the wines showed really high levels of methoxypyrazines. And that was the Klenazolza Family Reserve Sauvignon Blanc and the Ormond Chip of the Old Block Sauvignon Blanc. So these were quite particularly high levels, um, the IBMP going over 16 nanograms per liter. And then there's quite a few other wines also with high values, as you see Iona, the Ghost Corner and the Paul Kluvo and, and the Stellenbosch vineyards with, with a lot of methoxypyrazines, but perhaps not as high as these two. Then looking at the volatile files, which are 3 mh 3 mh a and 4MP. Um, firstly, looking at the 3MH, which is your compound more responsible for the passion fruit and perhaps citrus and grapefruit aromas. And there were four wines that had quite elevated levels of 3MH and elevated in terms of it was higher than 5,000 nanograms per litre, which is quite exceptional, I think, for South African wines. Um, these values are, are really, uh, you know, comparable to, to uh, many Marlborough wines, for instance, which, which are renowned for their volatile levels. So yeah, four of the wines really had incredible concentrations of 3MH. 
So that was the Silmore Limited Edition, the Dimmerstahl Winter Ferment, the Klenazal the Family Reserve, and the Starkonde Round Mountain um, had very high levels of 3MH. Looking at the second volatile thal, 3MHA, which is more your passion fruit of guava, and at high concentration, you start to get that sweaty aroma. And we had two wines with elevated levels. It was the Dimmerstahl Winter Ferment Sauvignon Blanc, as well as the Klenazolza Family Reserve Sauvignon Blanc, which both had more than 1,000 nanograms per liter of 3MHA, which I think is quite significant. But one thing that is quite astounding it's the fact that, you know, if I say that it's over a thousand is, is quite a lot. If you look at the Dimmer Dahl, I mean, that's over 6,000 nanograms per liter of 3MHA. That is a very high concentration, um, which, which is, is not something we often see in South African wines at all, not for 3MHA. So this is quite unique. Um, and then the other thing that is quite interesting is just to look at or to observe that the fact that 3MHA is actually higher in concentration compared to 3MH uh, for this specific sample. And this is also quite unusual. Now, I think the reason why we're seeing these kinds of results is that, first of all, the winemaking technique, I think, has a different influence on the thiols produced, uh, like I said, the winter ferment. But then also, the second thing is because this wine is still quite young. I um, mean, fermentation took place relatively recently. Um, you know, the 3MHA concentration is still quite high in the wine. And the, the wine hasn't aged. So the concentration, 3MHA is a compound that is not very stable and the concentration will inevitably decrease over time. Um, so, you know, this wine hasn't aged and the 3MHA concentration hasn't declined. But even if it does decline, I mean, you're starting at such an exceptionally high concentration. I'm, uh, I'm inclined to think that th this wine will, will age quite well due to that um, high concentration, especially if it is stored correctly. Then the last one is a 4MMP, which is more your black currant type of aroma. So you'll see the highest concentration was um, reported for the Iona Elgin Highlands Wild Ferment with 31 nanograms per litre of 4MMP. Now, in previous years in the top 10 lists, we've seen much higher values than around 30. We've, we've, I think we've gone up to 80 or even 100 nanograms per litre, which is quite exceptional and uh, interesting result. So to if we have to compare these results um i think that this year's top 20 our uh, top 10 wines perhaps is not so much um inclined to a higher for mp concentration however these i mean the 31 is still a significant value but we have seen much higher so this table is just showing us the methoxypyrazines and the volatile thals together and what i want to show you was that the Kleine Family Reserve Sauvignon Blanc was listed under one of the wines with high methoxypyrazine concentrations, as well as high 3MH and 3MHA concentrations. So here we have a wine with quite powerful um, aroma, uh, aroma composition in terms of it has high concentration of both of these almost extreme styles for Sauvignon Blanc. So I can, I mean, this wine, it must be really powerful in terms of um, the aromatic intensity, having both of these aroma classes present at significant concentrations. So this is, table is just showing us the top 10 wines with all of the uh, aroma attributes and just giving us a bit of an idea of the weight of the attributes for each wine. So you'll see at the top, we have the Alfie's Drift again, we've got the wines listed at the top, but then on the left-hand side, we have the different attributes. So we start with tropical fruit, citrus, stone fruit, floral, mineral plenty, green, herbaceous, oak, and black currant. Now you'll see for each wine, for instance, the Alfie's Drift, you have these different dots and that's just, 
in the, the larger the dot is, it's just giving us an indication of the more weight that specific attribute had for this wine. So putting it all together like this, we can quickly see when uh, certain attributes were quite pronounced in a wine and, and how that would compare to the rest of the top 10. So I'm highlighting here just the four wines which had the highest concentration of volatile thiols. Now, like I said, the volatile thiols are the compounds that give to you that tropical fruit uh, and citrus characters. It can also contribute to stone fruit, but you see the Silmore is quite a lot, um, the judges felt had a lot of, of these attributes, also Dimash Dal. The Klein is also a little bit less, which I'll just discuss a bit later. And then the Sarkonda also had a quite a prominent contribution of these attributes. But I want you to just observe that also think uh, wines like the Alpis Drift, the Ghost Corner, the Iona Elgin Highlands um, wine. I mean, for instance, these three wines also had quite a significant contribution of either tropical and and or citrus and or stone fruit. So. Um, you know, number one, it can mean that just because they have lower thyl concentrations compared to the others doesn't mean that the wine is not displaying those characters. The wines are still showing a lot of, of, of pronounced um, aromatic contribution. But then also, you know, there are other compounds which we did not measure, things like the esters, which are quite important for Sauvignon Blanc and white wines in general. And the esters can also contribute. We didn't measure that necessarily. so. Uh, just because it doesn't have a lot of volatile thals, this does not mean the wine is not uh, very aromatic. Um, to the contrary, we know that these top 10 wines are exceptional quality. So now if we move on and we look at the methoxypyrazines, if you remember that the Kleinazalza I said had quite a large green component and uh, a, a, a lot of methoxypyrazines present, and also the Ottoman ship of the old block also had a lot of methoxypyrazines. So the first thing I want to just mention here is that the Kleinazalza, like I said um, in the previous slide, you know, had a lot of volatile thiols. It also had a lot of methoxypyrazines in there. But you see that you, you'll see that the component from the volatile thiols is perhaps not as pronounced as is the methoxypyrazines. Now, we know from research that, you know, there are different types of sensory interactions between these different compounds. So the presence of methoxypyrazines can be dominating over the volatile thiols. Um, it, and what is nice about a wine like this is having high methoxypyrazine concentration with that absolute support from the, volat from the fruity volatile thiols to give that uh, complexity and that weight to that wine. But then another thing that I just want to point out, so again with the Dimash Dal winter ferment, is I said earlier there was quite a large green component in terms of sensory attributes perceived. And what is interesting is that when it comes to the analysis from the Dimash Dal winter ferment, there wasn't a particularly high concentration of methoxypyrazines in this wine. So you can actually be a little bit surprised that we are seeing this green um, aromas coming out so prominently. Now, one of the reasons for this could be the contribution from the volatile thiols to the perception of green aromas. For instance, at very high concentrations of 3MH or 3MHA can start to smell like box tree, which is a type of um, a bush. And then also another thing is uh, like the tomato leaf, which is a very specific character, which is uh, associated with volatile thals. They essentially give that tomato leaf character. And at very high concentrations, you start to really smell specifically that tomato leaf character. But the judges will perceive that not as tropical fruit or citrus. Tomato leaf will be perceived as greenness and herbaceousness. So it doesn't necessarily mean that this greenness comes from methoxypyrazines. It can also come from the volatile thals, which I suspect is the case in this wine. 
if we look at the perception of oak aromas in the wines, the judges especially pointed out the Sulmore as having quite a, a oak component and the Iona with also some oak attributes. But what is interesting here is that, like I said, six out of the 10 wines actually had oak contact, but it was just those two that really stood out to the judges as having a bit of an oaky character to it. And what I like about this is, well, number one, this is obviously well integrated and, and balanced. Again, that's why they're on the top 10 list. But for the other wines, uh, I would presume that the oak is quite well integrated, seeing that it's not specifically something standing out in terms of the wine sensory composition. So um, well integrated, clever use of oak by the winemakers and, and mindful use of oak so that it just adds to that complexity instead of really um, being a prominent section or prominent uh, attribute to the wine. And then lastly, the black currant, like I said, the Iona, it had some black currant character, and we also see that the judges were also showing, were also indicating some um, black currant characters, which could be due to that form in P present in this wine. So that's it for the 2020 Sauvignon Blanc top 10 in a nutshell presentation. We just have to say a few thanks to all of the contributors to the top 10 competition as well as this technical booklet but especially a big thank you to wine tech to karino kennedy who helped put this booklet together and um you know being able to get this information and getting all this technical information and the sensory analysis and the chemical analysis and everything through to the producers so that you guys can use this information um for to, to keep on producing quality Sauvignon your blanc wines from my side i thank you and you are more than welcome to contact me if you have any questions karin at basicwine.co.za um, any questions on the top 10 or any other Sauvignon your blanc related questions more than welcome thank you